Hi everybody, um, this is just a quick intro into the uh, patch edge weight map portion of my beta post fusion toolkit. Um, the tools in this kit, uh, really just a bunch of scripts, uh, aren't officially part of mesh fusion. Um, they're just little modeling utilities designed to help you get more uh, out of your uh, output fusion mesh. Um, the tools are fairly primitive uh, but useful at this state and uh, will continue to co-evolve with uh, Mesh Fusion and uh, hopefully they'll come together somewhere down the road. Um, I can't offer too much support for these tools at this time. Um, I need to stay focused on Mesh Fusion. So uh, enter at your own risk if you will, but uh, feel free to uh, contact me on the forums if you need help. Um, the uh, patch edge weight map tools uh, covered in this video uh, create weight maps based on the moto parts created when you uh, output your fusion uh, item as a mesh uh, when using airtight the uh, when using the airtight with parts option uh, by definition those parts are collections of polygons bounded by fusion strips uh, these tools create uh, weight maps with a gradient edge um, along and within that strip boundary uh, the regular row and column structure of the strip allows for uh, perfectly smooth boundary gradients and uh, that opens up some interesting uh, modeling uh, possibilities. Uh, there is no installer so you'll see, need to simply uh, drop this kit into your Moto uh, Kits folder which is inside of the content folder and you'll need to invoke the controls form uh, and add it to your Moto UI and you can do that by simply hitting Control alt f after you've installed the kit. Um, I'm showing the manual steps to uh, creating that form uh, just in case you need them uh, for other reasons. Alright, so uh, let's try this out on a really simple example, uh, a fusion item with just two meshes. Note that it has strip rows set to three. That's really the minimum you should use with these tools. And again, uh, just two meshes here, with one poking through the flattish uh, sort of surface of the other, creating a very simple strip. That's a good setup uh, to get a really clear look at the tools in action. So I'll output the uh, mesh in airtight final with parts, uh, which again is essential because we need those parts. Uh, and a quick note here, um, I've got an overriding material group up here at the top of the uh, shader tree uh, set to shade everything and that way I don't need to worry about uh, setting materials for individual parts. Okay so back to the mesh uh, make sure it's selected on the item level then run a couple of these setup scripts. Setup selection simply uh, internally defines some selection sets based on the strip geometry. Uh, CC sub D level 1 on uh, turns on Catmill Clark at level 1 for the entire mesh. Uh, there are some known issues with shading artifacts uh, when converting fusion output meshes to Catmill Clark, but still this is the best way to get into a mode where you can play with these tools interactively. Uh, since fusion uh, meshes are relatively dense, uh, setting sub D's to 1 is, uh, is plenty. Uh, this setup stuff only needs to be done uh, once after outputting your uh, mesh. Uh, one moto setting that is generally helpful when working with fusion meshes, uh, and this, this is true whether you're using these tools or not, is setting uh, polygon tag type to part. That means moto's material selection mode will detect parts rather than material selection sets. Uh, both are useful. Uh, but parts are what we need when using this particular tool. And again, those parts are generated when you output the mesh, and you can uh, find them in the statistics form. But, of course, it's easier and more intuitive to select them using the uh, material selection mode, uh, especially uh, in a more complex model where there are many uh, such parts. Alright, so uh, let's select this center part and create a weight map. Uh, the tools will create that map based on your current poly or vertex selection. Uh, 
and we want to include some of the strip rows in that selection. So we need to convert our part selection to polys and, uh, and grow it outward into the strip. And these two buttons do just that. Uh, we can grow by a specified number of rows, uh, but most often uh, we want to grow to the center of the strip, uh, the seam, if you will. And this second button, Grow to Seam, does that automatically. After clicking, we have our selection, and uh, the result field here uh, tells us how far it grew, by how many rows. Um, and there you can see that it, that it has indeed expanded to include the three inner rows of the seam. For reasons of best surface continuity, we want our weight map gradient to be confined to the center of those three rows. Now, this is not always essential, but it's the safest route. This next section of the controls lets us set where the gradient occurs. Uh, setting it by strip row number, counting inward from the uh, outer boundary of our selection. So in this case, we want the gradient to start and end within that second row. As you might imagine, uh, that won't be very useful with just one row of quads to manipulate. Uh, so we'll also slice that gradient row. Um, let's give it three slices. We'll leave these next two buttons alone and create a simple linear gradient. This set as falloff button uh, just specifies that we want to immediately use our weight map as a falloff once it's generated. And this uh, slice create patch weight map button uh, does the work. It does any slicing we've requested and it creates the weight map. I'll use this uh, handy vert map display toggle to take a look. And there you can see the sliced row and the gradient. With that weight map in place and set as our fall off, uh, the strip begins to act like a flexible membrane. The fall off has already been set to vertex map by the script. So as soon as I start scaling, the strip quads react accordingly, stretching according to their weight. Uh, this is similar to what you would get with Moto's soft selections, but it's more specific to this task. It's based on uh, the strip mesh topology rather than distance. So uh, weighting of the strip rows is precise and consistent. And of course there's the added option of slicing before setting the weights. As I scale, those weighted strip polys become a, a rather major feature of the model. This is much more than you could ever get from simply creating wider strips to begin with. This flexible strip can take on a wide range of forms, width variation, orientation, and profile. In fact, these strips can uh, grow in complexity by further slicing or simply re-weighting, uh, which I'll do now. Since I already have quite a few rows, um, I'll just create a new weight map with a non-linear profile. I'm leaving uh, the start row at 2 and setting the end row to 5 since we have more rows already to work with here. Uh, and I'm setting slices to 0 so no additional rows will be created. Uh, this time, we'll use the smooth profile, which means uh, weights will ease in and ease out uh, across the gradient. Clicking the Slice Create button generates a new map, as we can see in the Maps list. Looking at that map, you can see that it's spread over a number of quads, and uh, you can even get a sense that it eases in and out. And by the way, we still have our original map, and we can use uh, either at any time. As I move the mesh, you can see the rounding of the leading and trailing edges, again due to the smooth profile. Uh, and all variety of transforms can be applied. Um, like Mesh Fusion itself, this is largely about play and exploration. Uh, the behavior of this strip will vary quite a bit depending upon uh, the shape of the original surfaces, uh, the weight profiles we use here, and even the original uh, strip settings that you set up with Mesh Fusion. 
Uh, by the way, I should have uh, hidden this lower portion of the pallet. Um, it has nothing to do with the uh, patch edge weighting we're looking at here. It has to do with strips, and we'll look at that in another video. Uh, anyway, um, one of the ways you can get more variety out of these maps is by shrinking the selection, as I'm doing here. That, in essence, leaves behind part of the uh, earlier edits and tends to create more complex profiles. And naturally, you can keep going, uh, manipulating other patch scene portions of your model. Uh, this model has one other patch. So let's play with that patch, um, selecting it with the materials selection mode. We don't need to repeat the uh, setup steps up at the top here of the palette. Um, we can just go ahead and grow the scene. And uh, let me spin that around so you can see the selection. So I'll uh, set my start and end rows, um, set the slices, and go ahead and create the map. Uh, the script does get a little bit slower when there are more quads involved, but uh, there we go. There's the map, and uh, you can see the gradient. And once you have your weight map, um, what you get out of it, what you do with it, is pretty wide open. Um, here I can say try a, a bit of scaling, uh, including disproportionate scaling, and see how uh, that is affected by the weight map some fairly interesting results there and uh, maybe try something a little more interesting like a simple bend deform and again you can see how all of this is affected by the original uh, forms the original shapes of the surface and the strip uh, polygons And naturally, you can combine the weight maps with other falloffs. Uh, one important note, however, some little quirks in Moto's UI uh, mean that you are better off first setting uh, the other falloff and then adding back uh, the vertex map falloff, as you see me doing here. Uh, once all that's in place, you can see that uh, both falloffs are affecting the transform and a, uh, a little uh, nothing fusion mesh has uh, actually become uh, somewhat interesting. All right, that's about it for this one, guys. Thanks.